I just want to take a minute to let you know, if you like This Is Monsters, you might like my other show, Somewhere Sinister. Each season, we go to a different place and tell sinister stories from that area. You can check it out by going to this link here. Thanks so much, and on to the story. Callista Springer was trapped in a burning house, and she couldn't break free from the zip ties and chains that held her in place. She was locked in place, and her fate was sealed. 17-year-old Callista was going to die. The worst part was that it was her own parents who had locked her up and condemned her to death. This is Monsters. On May 22, 1991, Callista Springer was born to Norma Sweggles and Anthony Springer, who didn't stay in a relationship with each other. At the beginning of Callista's life, her mother, Norma, helped raise her, but her father, Anthony, wanted to have sole custody of his daughter. Norma constantly worried about Callista, insisting that the young girl was being abused by Anthony. But Norma's attempts to get custody of Callista were denied, and eventually the court ruled in Anthony's favor despite Norma's claims of abuse. In May of 1997, Anthony succeeded at permanently denying Norma's parental rights, and at six years old, Callista was officially adopted by Anthony and his new wife, Marcia, who went on to have two more daughters together. However, Anthony and Marcia's relationship was on rocky ground. Two years after the couple adopted Callista, Marcia took legal action against Anthony. He had anger issues that were getting worse and worse, and she was terrified that Anthony was going to end up hurting her or their children. Hmm, it's almost like Norma was right about Anthony. Weird. While she was filing for a personal protection order against her husband, Marcia told the judge in regards to Anthony, quote, he never has any kind words to say to the girls, and has never told them that he loves them. It's just constant yelling to shut up, get out of my way, and get out of my sight. My children and I need help getting out of this vicious cycle. It's only a matter of time before the children and myself become the physical targets of these rages. The fact that I am blind, having very limited sight in one eye, I feel without a protection order in place, he will do great bodily harm to me and my children. Details from a letter that Marcia wrote about her relationship with her husband revealed that he wasn't just verbally abusive. He was physically violent and deeply unstable. He was diagnosed with depression, attention deficit disorder, and bipolar disorder and refused to take his medication. Instead, he allowed his mental health to spiral. He wasn't able to hold down a job and spent what little money he had on himself, instead of on his family. He was constantly full of rage, and when that rage boiled to the surface, he would lash out. On one occasion, he punched a window, shattering the glass. He forced Marcia into sexual intercourse regardless of whether she consented or not. What Marcia found most disturbing was Anthony's recent fascination with dead things. One of his quote-unquote hobbies was taking home roadkill, removing the flesh by boiling the carcass, and then reassembling the skeleton by hand. According to Marsha, he was completely obsessed with the process, and it was often the only thing he wanted to talk about. On June 28, 1999, the court granted Marsha an order of protection against Anthony. However, just two months later, the order was dropped. Anthony and Marsha remained in a relationship and continued trying to raise their children together. Marsha wasn't the only one suffering because of Anthony's treatment, though, and despite what she said in her letter, Marcia didn't appear to be as much of a victim as she claimed. The couple's oldest daughter, Callista, had a difficult life. She was diagnosed to be on the autism spectrum as well as reportedly suffering from pica, an eating disorder that made her have irresistible cravings to eat inedible objects such as couch stuffing, glue, and sand. It wasn't Callista's autism that was the problem, though. No, the problem was how Marcia and Anthony treated her at home. Callista's school friends and teachers were horrified and concerned by the things she told them about her home life. Callista was often filthy because she was rarely allowed to bathe and had to re-wear dirty clothes. Sometimes she told her friends she was left chained to her bed. 
She was regularly beaten and forced to go to the bathroom in a bucket instead of using the toilet. Then, Callista's one slice of freedom was removed from her when her family decided to homeschool her and she stopped going to school. It had been the only time that Callista was able to socialize and feel like a normal kid, and more importantly, it was the only opportunity she had to ask for help and let other people know that she was being abused. Fifteen reports of abuse had been made by people Callista had talked to, including Anthony's mother, Suzanne Langdon. But although CPS was involved, Callista remained in her family's custody. These are some of the details provided in the reports made to CPS. Callista was hardly ever allowed to leave the house or play with her siblings. When she was permitted to go outside, she often had to stay on the front porch, sitting bent over with her head between her knees. She was treated lower than the animals, meaning that she was fed much smaller portions of food than her siblings or parents, and she was forced to eat her dinner on the floor instead of sitting at the table like the rest of the family. When she wasn't physically restrained, she was restrained psychologically to keep her in one place. Her parents would use tape to mark a small square on the floor which Callista wasn't allowed to leave. Other times, she was forced to stand with the tip of her nose touching a piece of tape stuck to the wall. Sometimes the tape would be placed so high that she needed to stand on her tiptoes for hours. Callista's aunt, Valerie Springer, had made multiple reports to CPS when Callista was around six or seven years old. The first report was made when Valerie noticed that Callista had a bloody lip, and the second report was due to infected burns on Callista's hand, which had never been treated. An anonymous report made in 2001 detailed statements made by Marcia Springer about Callista. The report claimed that Marcia said she planned to put Callista into the foster care system as soon as she turned 12, but that she hoped Callista was dead before then. One of the concerned people who reported Anthony and Marcia to CPS received a reply from the agency. It read, quote, this notice is being sent to inform you that your complaint of child abuse or neglect has not been accepted for investigation. The reason is, the allegation was essentially the same instance as an allegation previously reported and investigated. So CPS got a report of abuse, and when they got a second report for the same abuse, essentially backing up the first claim, they were just like, eh, we looked into one, no need to waste our time. CPS was aware that Callista's parents regularly tied her to the bed and advised them against doing that to discipline her. At one point, a CPS worker, Patricia Skelding, reportedly made a statement that would turn out to be prophetic, telling Anthony and Marcia, quote, Do not underestimate the power of a house fire. That was because, if a fire were to take place, Callista's restraints would leave her helpless, something that probably seems obvious to most people. Anthony and Marcia ignored that advice and continued to leave Callista chained to her bed for hours at a time. In Patricia's investigative report, she concluded that she hadn't found enough evidence to prove that Callista was being abused or neglected. However, she was extremely concerned about what she had seen in the Springer family home. Apparently, chaining a child to their bed is not considered abuse. In a section of her report, she said, quote, I am very uncomfortable with the way Callista is being treated and targeted. I can only hope that it really is necessary and for her own protection. I tried to talk Marcia into letting Callista have a toothbrush and toothpaste supervised. It seemed to mean a lot to Callista. Marcia said no. Callista was adamant about Marcia pulling her hair. Callista repeated this incident several times. Callista said that her sisters were not there when it happened. Callista is known to make up stories and she is not credible. It ends up that it is her word against Marcia's word. I couldn't tell by looking at the crown of her head that hair was missing. The parents used a device to tie Callista to her bed. Anthony said that it is the same device used in adult nursing homes that alert staff when adults get out of bed and roam around. Callista's siblings say that they have not seen their mother Marcia hit Callista, pull her hair, or be mean to her in any way. They say that their mother is very patient with Callista. There was insufficient evidence to prove neglect or abuse. After the report was complete, Patricia seemed to have second thoughts and added an extra handwritten statement, which read, quote, Callista is a very vulnerable child. Because she is not believed or credible, she would also be an easy target to abuse her. I think we need to check out all complaints regarding her. Despite Patricia's obvious concerns, her supervisor agreed that there was insufficient evidence to prove abuse or neglect. 
Callista Springer's case was then closed. It was February 27, 2008, four years after Patricia Skelding's investigation, when Callista's abuse came to a head. Like usual, Callista was in her bedroom, zip-tied to the bed and wearing a heavy dog chain around her waist. Downstairs, Marcia was reportedly doing chores when she noticed a strong smell of smoke. Thinking it was coming from the vacuum cleaner she was using, she turned it off, but the smell persisted. Marcia went to the kitchen to investigate and saw that the house was on fire. One by one, the members of the family and their dog made their way outside. All of them knew that Callista was chained to the bed, yet none of them did anything about it, even as they watched the house burn. They had saved the dog, but abandoned Callista. That night, Anthony talked to reporters about Callista. He was seemingly in shock, telling them his daughter had liked to draw, paint, and color, and suggested that the family would have to move out of town to heal from the tragedy. At this stage, investigators were not yet aware that the daughter Anthony was speaking of had been tied up and left to die a painful death. Callista's body was found in bed. The fire had not made it to her, preserving the evidence of the dog chain and zip ties tied to her body, although heat had melted some of the plastic. There were no blankets or sheets to cover her. Her bed didn't even have a pillow. She had died slowly and painfully of smoke inhalation. Shortly after Callista's death, her two half-sisters, age 12 and 14, were removed from Anthony and Martha's care and placed in temporary foster homes where they were cared for by family members. Astonishingly, after a hearing, the Michigan Department of Human Services determined that the best option for Callista's sisters was to return them to her parents' custody. Fortunately, a judge disagreed and the two girls remained in foster homes. However, Anthony and Marcia were allowed to have supervised visits with their remaining children from then on. Six months later, Marcia decided not to contest the charges of child neglect and abuse that she faced, although it's crucial to understand that these charges had nothing to do with her role in Callista's eventual death. Anthony, however, refused to admit to ever neglecting or abusing Callista. He insisted that, because of her autism, Callista was prone to running away from home in the middle of the night, to the point where the family had to use an alarm system to monitor her whereabouts. They had only tied her up, Anthony said, for her own protection after the alarm had somehow been broken. Because Anthony hadn't been home when the fire started, police weren't able to prove that he had been aware of Callista being tied to the bed at the time. In September, seven months after the fire, Anthony provided the court with papers supporting his claims that no abuse or neglect had led to Callista's death. He cited that professionals had determined that his daughter had very little impulse control, and that her pica disorder had caused her to harm herself in the past by attempting to eat objects such as razor blades. One of his statements, more than anything else, revealed the way he truly felt about Callista. Anthony said that the best outcome for Callista would have been living in a care facility once she reached adulthood, and that he didn't believe she would have ever been able to do something with her life. Despite Anthony's denial, both he and Marcia were charged with first-degree child abuse and manslaughter in December of 2008. Less than two months later, Prosecutor John McDonough reviewed the case against the couple and decided that more severe charges were necessary. Anthony and Marcia were now accused of torture and felony murder, and if they were found guilty in court, they would be sentenced to life in prison. At the trial, more than 80 witnesses took the stand. Callista's teachers, who remembered the troubled girl before she was pulled out of public school, contested Anthony's statements that Callista was severely disabled and would never be able to function in life. In fact, her teachers insisted that Callista had seemed relatively normal, with only very minor issues caused by her autism. She had been competent at school, able to read and write. A police officer commented on Anthony and Marcia's decision to homeschool Callista, calling it, quote, a ruse to keep Callista out of the public eye. One of Callista's friends read out loud from a letter that Callista had sent to her. Written in red crayon, it said, quote, I gave my stepmother a good long complaint on how she treats me differently. I get hooked up to my bed with a plastic tie twister. I have to put the chain under my blanket. She is putting me deeper into my grave, and when she puts me to bed, I feel blue and start crying. Anthony had consistently painted a picture of Callista as a severely disabled teenager who acted like a child and had very little rational thinking. 
The latter, where Callista clearly acknowledged that she was being abused and, quote, put deeper into her grave, gives a morbid insight into how Callista really viewed the situation. It seemed that she knew she was in danger, but there was nothing she could do about it. In response to the letter, Anthony denied that it was written by his daughter, saying, quote, She couldn't spell a word like complain. She couldn't write in cursive, and the word stepmother never came up in our family. The mother of another of Callista's friends told the jury that she had personally filed two separate reports of abuse to CPS after she had seen bruises on Callista's arms. Callista also told Beth that she wasn't getting fed at home. When Beth offered her a banana to take with her, Callista declined because her parents would see the peel and then she would get in trouble. She told Beth that it would be okay for her to take an apple home with her because she could hide it from her parents by eating the entire core. At one point during the trial, a member of the prosecution held something up to the jury. It was one of the chains that had been used to restrain Callista at night, with a zip tie still attached to it. As well as being tied to the bed, it turned out that Callista had also been drugged. A medical examiner told the jury that Callista's autopsy had revealed that she had been given at least six Benadryl, well above the safe dose of one to two tablets. An overdose of Benadryl can cause symptoms such as confusion, extreme drowsiness, hallucinations, and even seizures or death. Because of the high dose of the drug in her system, it's possible that even if Callista hadn't been tied up, she wouldn't have been able to escape the fire without help. Anthony admitted to giving his daughter high doses of Benadryl to, quote, make her sleep. The defense's argument hinged on the same claims Anthony had been making since the fire, that Callista had never been abused and had only been restrained for her own safety. Their evidence included a history of Callista escaping the house to walk through the streets in the middle of the night, including the times her pica had reportedly made her eat razor blades, nails, and pens. The defense also made the claim that Callista had acted violently towards her family members at times, which was never able to be verified. While Anthony and Marcia and their defense attorneys argued that Callista had shown severe behavioral issues, many of the prosecution's witnesses disagreed. While Callista did misbehave in small ways, such as minor stealing at school, she always returned what she had stolen when she was asked. A school counselor told the court that she believed Callista stole to get attention and would, quote, smile from ear to ear when somebody paid attention to her. Once, Callista had told the counselor, quote, I wish I had a new family and more friends. Apart from the minor stealing, the school staff who testified agreed that Callista usually tried hard and performed well in school. Anthony continued to absolve himself of any blame, instead blaming prosecutors and Michigan Child Protective Services for using the Springer family as a scapegoat. He addressed the prosecution, saying, quote, What we did may have been wrong, and I still question that every day. We were at fault for her dying in the fire, but it was not all just us on our own. This community is afraid to look itself in the mirror because it's afraid to see that it failed to help our family. In return, it's more than happy to evict us so that it can sleep with a clear conscience at night. Society and the system that we have now are perhaps at fault as much as we are. To her credit, Marcia didn't try to shift the blame onto anybody but herself and Anthony. She said, quote, Callista was my daughter and it was an accident. My two other girls and my husband have been going through hell since my daughter has been dead. I will carry this with me for the rest of my life and I am very sorry. She admitted that she had been the one to tie Callista to the bed on multiple occasions, saying that she sometimes restrained Callista so that she could get the housework done. In a final statement to the court, Anthony and Marcia's defense attorney said, quote, I think they made mistakes, maybe in how they tried to deal with the situation, but the situation with Callista was real, and it had to be dealt with in some way. We can argue if there were better ways, there probably are. I think the overwhelming issue is, the community knew about this, the Michigan Department of Human Services knew about this, and certainly the schools knew about this. Do they have to take some responsibility for what has been a very unfortunate result? Yes. The jury reached their conclusion on February 22, 2010. Anthony and Marcia Springer were found guilty of both torture and child abuse, but not of Callista's murder. At their sentencing, the judge addressed the couple, saying, quote, there's plenty of blame to go around for everybody. I think it's fair to say the state of Michigan failed you and your family, clearly. Those charged to protect her did not do their jobs. 
We're not here today because of something they did, though, but because they didn't protect her from you. Anthony Springer was sentenced to a minimum of 25 years in prison for torture, as well as 10 years for child abuse. Marsha was sentenced to 19 years for torture and a minimum of 8 years for child abuse. The judge explained his rationale for giving Anthony a more severe sentence, explaining that he'd made this decision because it had been Anthony's idea to chain Callista to her bed. In the judge's opinion, Anthony had been the ringleader and Marsha had just been following orders. A government report into CPS's failure to remove Callista from her parents' custody reads, quote, Callista was in danger before Patricia Skelding's investigation. Callista continued to face that exact same danger after. Ultimately, she died from that danger. Callista Springer was failed over and over again, regardless of the severity of her disability and behavioral problems. It's clear from witness statements that she was a teenage girl with friends, hobbies, and interests. She was failed by CPS, who failed to prove abuse despite a concerning investigation into her home life. She was failed every time a report about her home life was dismissed. But more than anything else, it was Anthony and Marcia Springer who failed Callista. They acted like monsters, and a teenage girl lost her life because of it. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.